Welcome everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. <laughs> my name is Alan Gerard. I'm with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I run our Eastern Shore office and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Queen Anne's County Board of Commissioners Candidate Forum for the Environment. We've got a great program for you tonight. Appreciate everyone braving the weather to come out here. Um, We've got a good program here. I, I, it's important to let you know that we've invited all of the candidates for the Queen Anne's County Board of Commissioners to come to the program this evening. And uh, the, the Bay Foundation, who is sponsoring tonight's program, is not able to support or oppose or endorse any candidates, but we are able to educate. And if you haven't picked one up at the table, Hillary has these to hand out the five things your next local officials can do for the environment. Um, if they become elected. Make sure you grab one of those because they're, those are uh, include some information that we are sharing with candidates throughout Maryland that are running for local office and give you some ideas on different policies or considerations that should be thought about um, as we are electing folks to represent us in office. Um, Hillary also has a copy of the agenda uh, that we're gonna be working through this evening and on the back of the agenda, there are audience participation guidelines. We will be inviting later in the program an opportunity for you to ask questions of the candidates by note card. Uh, there's going to be no coming up to the mic this evening, but you will have an opportunity to write your question on a note card, and we'll be vetting those and getting them up to the moderator so that they can be asked later on this evening. Um, do want to thank Chesapeake College for uh, helping co-host the program this evening. And also Washington College, who is providing us a moderator this evening. Where is Greg? Oh, he's finished. There he is. Greg Farley is the uh, new <coughs> director of sustainability at Washington College. And I'm going to turn over the mic to him now so he can lead us through the rest of the program. Here you go, Greg. Thank you, Alan. Thank you to all the candidates for being here this evening. This is an important act of civic engagement. Thank you to all of you for taking time out of what is an extraordinarily rainy evening to find your way from whatever hinterland parking lot you have to park in. Um, I'm with Washington College at the moment, but I worked here at Chesapeake for years and years, and so the, this place always has a fond space in my heart. Um, one of the things I know from having taught in this very space is that as people come in late, they will do something crazy like climb over the back row of seats and then fall forward. <laughs> Could I ask all of you to stand up and take a two-seat shuffle to the inside of the lecture hall, just so as people come in, there are seats on the margin for them to sit. Thank you very much. The format for tonight's event is as follows. Uh, we will allow each candidate two minutes for an opening statement. Our volunteer timekeepers in the front down here will take a will be your, your guide to when your time is up. We do ask you to try and honor the time uh, time limit. Each question that we present, and we I have some that I've prepared, and then we are soliciting others from the audience and bringing those forward. We'll be given one minute to respond to each question. I'll begin with Mr. Steve Wilson on the end and move in this direction. The second question, we'll go to Mr. Jack Wilson. The third question to Mr. Tillman. Um, and we will make sure that all of you get a chance to begin. Apologies to those of you sitting at this end of the table. Uh, but that, gives, that makes sure we don't start with the same person every time. So uh, in an attempt to be equitable, we'll try and keep the time going and keep, keep the, uh, the flow of the event moving. Um, are there any questions? All right. So I polled a small group of about 50 of my friends and neighbors. Um, I actually live in Kent County, so my, I, I actually tried to poll friends and neighbors who live here in Queen Anne's um, and try to discern what uh, issues are of importance to them. And it was amazing how many of them reached back to touch on the comprehensive plan. Um, the introduction to the 2010 comprehensive plan begins with a series of statements about a community vision. One part of that vision is the, oh sorry, we need opening statements first. <laughs> Let's do that, shall we? Many apologies, everybody. Um, two minutes per, per candidate. Mr. Steve Wilson, will you please open? Uh, this is, uh, do we get a microphone or have you? You are mic'd on the table, sir. Oh, okay. We can hear you well out here. Excellent. Hi, folks. My name is Steve Wilson. I've been a county commissioner for three and a half years. And uh, <coughs> the 
all of us have been concerned, but have not a great deal to do with the promotion of the well-being of the Chesapeake Bay. But insofar as we can at any time aid and give comfort to the people that are working on it, we do. We support it with money, with our WIP program, and in a variety of other ways. I think a thing which is to be remembered about the Bay is that the problem we have here is almost an insoluble one, it's called people. That when there were a few million people here, it was not stressed very much, but now that the Bay watershed has 18 million people in it, it produces a great deal of sewage and runoff and farm fertilizer and one thing and another. And we're gonna be in a race in between the improving technology, which we have from better sewage plants and better management practices, with the drift upward of population. Those two things are in conflict with each other. I am hopeful that the technology and better management practices are able to keep ahead of it. I, I fear for our future. If you saw the Times this morning, there were two articles about the fact that basically global warming and some aspects of our ecological health are in much sharper deterioration. And I am of the fear that we are not in the eighth inning, but in extra innings or overtime in terms of turning the situation around. So it's my strong hope that by public awareness, we do a lot more as a people, not just as a local government. That's it. Mr. Jack Wilson, two yes, minutes, please. I am Jack Wilson. I am County Commissioner for District 1, and <coughs> as well as candidate for County Commissioner in District 1. Um, I just want to highlight some things that I have been working on since I've been a commissioner, and then I'm going to continue for the next four years um, going down the road to uh, help the Bay. Um, one of the things is that, as Steve mentioned, we are uh, we have put aside money to leverage for meeting some of our WIP projects, whether it's uh, fire retention ponds, um, the shoreline um, redo at Conquest Beach, projects like that. Uh, also, I want to continue to support alternative uh, runoff mitigation methods. Uh, one in particular is a farmer we have here in Queen Anne's County, Sam Owens. Unfortunately, he's met with a lot of red tape at the state level, and I'm working with him to try and uh, cut through that red tape. He has a phenomenal program. Um, once it's instituted, it'll be a tool in the toolbox for a lot of farmers to generate some additional income on their farms on untillable land. So it's a great project. Um, the other thing is to continue to support our watermen and their efforts to reseed the oysters in the bay um, to both help with filtration in the bay and help their industry as a whole. I want to continue to support the efforts of our governor who has reached out and has put forward efforts to get the Conowingo cleaned up behind it. Um, I know it's a long-term project, but I think every county on the Bay Watershed should be supporting those efforts. And the last thing is, I'm gonna continue to support in a hands-on effort, uh, Ken Island Beach cleanups, who I've been with since a little after their inception. And I think it's important that, uh, you know, we, we can talk about Bay and things we can do for the Bay, but I think when you go out there and you actually use your hands and your sweat equity in the Bay, I think that uh, provides some uh, long-term results as well. Thank you. Mr. Tillman, two minutes, please. Yeah, my name is Ben Tillman. I'm a candidate for the County Commission in District 2, and a uh, long time involvement with Queen Anne County. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I was in the publishing and printing business, uh, retired from there in sales, and have for the last 30 years been running the family farm out near the 4 H. <coughs> When I think about cleaning up the bay, I think about what the farmers have done. And I'm fond of saying that the farmers have contributed to their share of the problem, but they've also contributed to their share of the solution. The difficulty we face now is that a lot of the low-hanging fruit, or a lot of the easy solutions, have been implemented. And we have to dig deeper and deeper into more complex issues, such as stormwater runoff, which was labeled the rain tax, whatever that means. Uh, into uh, fertilizers on golf courses, for instance, and, and things of that nature. And we have to be willing to cooperate and work closely with all facets of the government and also the uh, environmental organizations. What brings it home to me is that there are certain places where I used to walk on the farm as a youngster that I can't walk on anymore. They're wet. Uh, they're marsh. I used to be able to jump across them. 
uh, lest we think that global warming and sea level rise is some sort of manipulation or data error or something of that nature, I'm here to tell you that it absolutely isn't true. I also personally happen to believe that human endeavor has been involved in that. Uh, and I think until we accept the fact that the problem is real, we're going to have difficulty finding solutions. Uh, I think, the, as uh, both the former gentlemen have mentioned, it's a difficult problem because it involves five states and people 100 miles from here up the Susquehanna River. Uh, I think what's really important is that we have the comprehensive plan right. It'll be involved in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Mr. Moran, two minutes, please. Yes, my name is Jim Moran, and I've been your at-large county commissioner for four and a half years. Um, you know, I would say Queen Anne's County has a long history of environmental stewardship with strong protections for our waterways, including the most tier two pristine steam streams, excuse me, in the state, according to the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. The county is second only to Carroll County, Maryland, in land use set aside for preservation of agriculture with over 80,000 acres permanently preserved as open space on in our agricultural easements. Key to moving forward in the 21st century is the coastal community of Queen Anne's County uh, is further understanding and protection of our residents, their property, and as well as the county owned facilities from sea level change. Sunny and nuisance flooding and water quality issues as a result of storm events as well as supporting our two valuable industries in our county, agriculture, fishing, and hunting. And I will say that this set of commissioners <coughs> Put, a, put aside more money than any other set of commissioners before them, $2 million into WIP programs, and nowhere else in the state of Maryland has a project reduced nitrogen in the, in, into the Chesapeake Bay as our Southern County Island sewer. So these are two great accomplishments for this set of commissioners, and we look to do more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mrs. Krieger, two minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for hosting us tonight. Thank you for moderating. Thank you for all of you coming out in this terrible weather tonight. Uh, climate change is real. It doesn't just rain anymore, it pours. So anyway, my name is Deborah Kruger. I am running for county commissioner from District 4. And my priorities as far as the environment is concerned would be really focusing on the updated comprehensive plan. We need to pro um, provide a vision for our community in terms of hazard mitigation plans, which coincidentally the county is in the process of updating now. If you have any concerns about that or if you want any input into that, there's actually a survey up right now on the county website and you can fill that out if you want some input as to the updated um, hazard mitigation plan. Also, sea level rise needs to be addressed in our comprehensive plan. I have a little um, study here from the sea level rise and coastal vulnerability from March 2016. And again, because I'm from District 4, I'm looking at, I don't know if you can see it, but here's District 4, here's District, District 3. District 4 and District 3 have the highest incidence of flooding in the county. They have the high, highest probability of having catastrophic um, flooding in the county. So I would definitely be interested in making sure that we had some strong language as far as sea level rising, looking at new building codes and looking at stormwater plans. Secondly, again, because I am from the fourth district and I have knocked on a lot of doors down in Roman Coke on the Bay and Ken Island Estates, I would work closely with the people down there that are currently having that septic system installed and make sure that everything was going smoothly for them. I promised them that if I was elected, I would continue to reach out to them and I would. And lastly, I would work closely with, um, I've talked to so many experts in trying to educate myself about the environment. I would continue to reach out to them, and I would work with our private nonprofits in the area um, that are working really hard to educate people about the environment, specifically single-use plastics. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gruber. Mrs. Harrison, two minutes, please. Hi, I'm Elaine Harrison, and I grew up on Ken Island, and I've seen lots of changes in this county over the last 50-some years. Um, I, I'm concerned about the comprehensive plan as we move forward and revisit that in this next term, that we have to have balance. We have to um, ensure that our Chesapeake Bay stays clean and healthy for our watermen. We have to uh, keep our farms as healthy and productive as they can be. And we have to balance the needs of people in that in that vision as well. Um, there's there's a lot of things that we can do, and we've started on a lot of good programs here. We need to make sure that this step system that we're putting in down at Ski actually performs as we hope it will. 
Um, we have to also watch what we're doing within our other jurisdictions that are on sewer plants as we're meeting, we're coming to the tops of our capacities there. And we really need to plan that accordingly. So I look forward to uh, working with the, um, with the various groups in the area, the environmental experts, the folks like Mr. Farley who does sustainability practices at the colleges, and bringing all of our experts together so that we have a good comp plan moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. Mr. Dumino, two minutes, please. Good evening, everybody. My name is Phil Dumino. I was a previous commissioner in Queen Anne's County, the third district, uh, where I'm seeking um, to serve again um, in 2011 to 2014. It was our administration that actually got the WIP plan kick-started. Um, we're pretty proud of our efforts to hit our reduction goals. Uh, we have some great folks that work uh, within Queen Anne's County government um, and collaboratively with the environmental folks to try to come up with a plan that is best going to serve everybody. Um, organizations like Ten Island Beach Cleanup and the efforts uh, that those folks make uh, to rally the citizens of Queen Anne's County are great programs and great organizations and would certainly continue to help and endorse them. Um, Commissioner Moran had mentioned um, the reductions and how well we're doing uh, in our benchmarks as far as the reduction lows that we are, are have committed to in our, in our WIP plan. Um, I would like to see a collaborative effort on the part of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Counties and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation when it comes to um, working closely with Pennsylvania and, and New York. Uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Tillman had mentioned the concerns about um, the effects of the Susquehanna River and the Conowingo Dam when it's opened up. You know, we have farmers that are, are making an effort to institute programs on their farms to reduce the runoffs. Uh, so we're putting pieces in place uh, and I think to continue to do that would be a commitment, certainly a commitment that I would uh, be more than willing to make. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dumino. Mr. Coulter, two minutes, please. Good evening. I'm Jim Coulter. I'm running for Commissioner of 3rd District. Uh, I'm an Army veteran, went to school under the GI Bill, got a bachelor's degree in, in business and an MBA in finance. I grew up with uh, a father that was a uh, environmental engineer. He was in charge with the uh, uh, water pollution control of the Ohio River Basin. And so whenever he came home, we would talk septic tanks and sewage treatment plants. <laughs> now, I mean, how many people out here in the evening would discuss? That's my background. Uh, he's a good man. He taught me the, uh, the importance of balancing the environment with business concerns and growth. Everything is a balance. You have to understand all the details. You have to understand uh, the, the problems, the issues, and the nuances of the issues in order to make good policy decisions. Hopefully, I'll be able to, uh, to do that. I'll be your full-time commissioner. I'll be able to roll up my sleeves with an understanding and background in both finance and environment I'll be able to help us make good decisions about the environment. Some of the issues that we face are, of course, the 10-year ten, ten comprehensive plan. That is a roadmap to the future. That is something that takes thousands of hours to put together. Once it's put together, it becomes a plan that we need to live by, a plan we need to manage by, a plan we need to govern by. It's a very important document. It has to do with traffic, has to do with growth, has to do with job growth, a number of things. Very, very important document. In addition, I think we should emphasize smart growth and, and uh, enforce envir environmental laws, especially the runoff laws. Finally, traffic control is a very, very important environmental issue, as well as a development issue, growth, edu gro growth issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Mr. Corturino, two minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Um, I, first, I want to thank the, uh, the commissioners and former Commissioner Duvinell for their efforts that they have done uh, for preserving our natural resources here with the nitrogen load reductions, the open space programs. I hope to work with them to build upon those and not just work with them, but work with the stakeholders uh, and the citizens that have concerns. 
Um, there are a lot of different interests, um, a lot of different opinions, and there are a lot of complex issues that are involved that, including a lot of regulatory framework. Uh, and that's what I do. I'm a lawyer. I negotiate with people. I try to bring about compromises with people, uh, take comp complex issues, and try to find uh, a common ground that we can find on that. that. That's something that I hope to do with both the comprehensive plan and preserve the natural resources. This is important to me because I, I came of age in this county. Uh, in, in the summer times, I would be out crabbing in the bay, me boarding in the, in the Wye River. I worked at Pioneer Arrows Yacht Haven. When the watermen would come in to refill the diesel, I would talk to them. When it was uh, time to harvest the corn, I worked at my friend's farm, helping him out. I have a great deal of admiration, not just for the beauty of the natural resources, natural resources that we have here, but for those who earn their living off of our natural resources. And we need to protect both of them. We need to look after all of them to make sure that this county stays the beautiful place it is. Uh, I have three young daughters who are growing up in this county. I want them to have those same experiences that I have in this county. Um, and I was going to demonstrate my commitment to the environment by showing you my Prius that I came in tonight, but I think it's floating away down the parking lot right now. Uh, but uh, I think they can vouch for me on that. Thank you. I look forward to hearing your questions, and I hope I can earn your vote. Thank you to all the candidates for their opening statements. Small programming note, I've been asked to move this microphone. So should I repeat what I said? <laughs> I mean, you're fine. I think that would be zero. <laughs> All right. So um, as I as I began earlier, I alluded to the comprehensive plan. I think many of you have already touched on this. So I want to go directly to the heart of that question. Um, a part of the sort of vision statements in the current comprehensive plan state that we are a county that encourages agriculture, seafood, and maritime industries, tourism, and outdoor sports, small business, and high tech enterprise. We are a good place to work. The question for candidates, how should the county best balance economic and environmental priorities, and what core policies do you propose or support that will help achieve that balance? I would remind candidates we are asking for one minute answers. Please heed your time your timekeepers in the front row. Uh, Mr. Steve Wilson, one minute, please. I think that I tend to lean toward the environmental side. Uh, generally speaking, the thing which tends to degrade the environment more than anything is fast construction. So I'm a heavy believer in slowing that down. I think also, <clears throat> a thing which has been mentioned was the tremendous amount of load of bad nutrients and destructive material that come down the Susquehanna River. And I think that the state of Maryland government people, and I mean specifically Cardin, Rufus Berger, Van Holland, we need to get to those people to put the arm on Pennsylvania to stop dropping so much, so much uh, farm waste and, and, and uh, industrial waste in the river. To just kind of sit here and think we can fix it. We can't. But the state of Maryland can use whatever political leverage it has to get this done. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jack Wilson, one minute, please. Uh, yeah, I just think economic and environmental can go hand in hand anywhere you are, whether it's Queen Anne's County or, or any part of the state. And, and I think the balance comes in how you have your building codes, how you look at uh, where you're going to allow for economic growth through construction or redevelopment or however you're going to do it. Um, but I think one of the challenges there is, uh, quite honestly, there's not people beating down the doors here in Queen Anne's County to put um, their businesses here, larger businesses, are ones that would have a huge uh, environmental impact because, quite frankly, we have a shortage on uh, broadband connectivity throughout the county, which uh, hurts our economic development in other parts of the county that have land that can be developed and, environment and, and developed environmentally soundly, um, speaking specifically in North County. So I think there's some other issues we have to address, and as uh, uh, Mr. Corcorino said, there, there, every problem has uh, many different uh, uh, pieces and parts to go with it, and some are more complex than others. So I think that the key is to take each thing on its individual merits and work from there. Thank you. Mr. Tillman, one minute, please. Uh, the really interesting thing to me about the comprehensive plan is that it, while people think of it perhaps as simplifying it as just a zoning document, it's a many-faceted tool that we have. And 
I think before we start thinking about new construction, it's probably wise to say, are we making the best use of what we already have? Infill, repurposing of uh, buildings and factories and industrial space where you already have a parking lot there. You don't have to put in a new parking lot. And I think every time we as new commissioners make a decision about the comprehensive plan, we have to take into consideration all of the environmental implications of what we do, what we assign a zone to in a certain part of the uh, county. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Tilden. Mr. Moran? Well, I, I, I'm hoping we're supposed to be talking about climate adaptation and resiliency. So the county, in cooperation and support from the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, has participated in founding the Eastern Shore Climate Adaptation Program, or excuse me, partnership, with five other jurisdictions in the mid to upper Eastern Shore. This partnership issues a white paper on climate change and received a grant to map the evidence of sea level change with Salisbury University GIS Division. This mapping has detailed areas in the county prone to increase sea level change and flooding and will be used in the county's hazard mitigation planning and to update of the next Queen Anne's County Comprehensive Plan in 2020. The county is also completing efforts to participate in FEMA's Community Rating System, CRS, which, when completed, will help reduce flood insurance rates and establish means for preventing property loss due to flooding and extreme weather events. So, Mrs. Kruger, one minute, please. Thank you. So again, I come back to the comprehensive plan. I would um, make sure that um, zoning regulations were based on policy um, and not politics. I agree with what Ben said, let's make use of buildings that are ready there, let's retrofit some of those buildings before we start building more buildings. Let's go from inwards outwards. And I would um, carefully study any environmental impact that any project presented to me had, speak to the people that would be most affected by it before I made decisions. I believe in making well-rounded decisions, speaking to as many experts as I can before I make a decision, and really contemplating the risks versus the, the pros versus the cons before I would make those decisions, but definitely believe in retrofitting and infill build from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Harrison. I'd like to echo that as well. We we have so many vacant spaces that have already been paved over, and we need to make the most of those before we start paving over farmland. We need to make sure we do everything we can to keep our bay as clean as possible because so many of, of, our, of our community members, they, they make their living off of the bay. And its health is vital to the seafood industry. We're seeing more and more illnesses um, cropping up in people because of their exposure to uh, bad elements that are out there in the water. And we need to mitigate those as much as possible so that we can have a healthy seafood industry in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dumino? Mr. Frawley, could you please read the question again? <laughs> How should the county best balance economic and environmental priorities, and what core policies do you propose or support that would help achieve that balance? That was for the, the audience, not for me. Um, I, we get further away from the original question, and, and the answers start to deviate away from the original question. So. Um, as I mentioned before, um, my experience as a commissioner in the past uh, and initiating uh, with my other commissioners the uh, watershed implementation plan, one of the key components I think is correct with, uh, with um, my fellow candidates is the comprehensive plan. But I can speak um, from experience when I say that we have strict environmental guidelines that must be adhered to, and I think that those strict environmental guidelines that are in our comprehensive plan need to be continued um, to be uh, uh, held in, um, in high regard as far as development that takes place. But we have a well-educated planning staff that works for the county and these employees know their stuff. Um, so uh, just a continued commitment to staff. And, uh, and then again, real quick, I'd like to see that our developers work collaboratively with our environmental folks to reach some sort of compromise in some of these larger projects. Thank you, Mr. Dumino. Mr. Colton. Well, I think there's plenty of opportunities for us to go uh, aggressively look for jobs uh, that, uh, that have a positive Im impact on the environment. Today I was talking to an oyster farmer. This guy told me about his uh, 
his business. He's able to, to make a profit after seven years by uh, oyster farming uh, a five acre plot off the Chester River. I talked to, uh, the other day I talked to an organic farmer, a young gentleman who was able to make, uh, make a good living of 100 acres doing, doing organic farming. There's plenty of opportunities. What are, what are not opportunities, when we look down Route 50 about, uh, about some of our, uh, our recent job growth, are uh, Wawa, two IHOPs, or IHOP, and two Royal Farms. What we have to do is we have to plan and aggressively seek out jobs for this county. We uh, unfortunately cut the budget for economic development in half of this year's budget. And, and friends, you can't earn revenue if you fire the sale. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Mr. Corcorino, one minute. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the simple answer, um, the complex question is you listen. Right. You listen to the stakeholders, listen to the, have, have a summit with the business leaders, find out what do they need in order to grow their business, what do they need to attract new business here, right? You, the other stakeholders, the environmental groups, you, you talk with them, you find out what their concerns are. And, and as uh, Commissioner Dumanel, former Commissioner Dumanel mentioned, you, you bring them together and, and you get them to talk out the issues. I resolve many lawsuits that I'm involved with through mediation, you bring everybody together, you get them to sit down in the room, you talk about what your differences are, what your similarities are, and what you find out is you have a lot more in common than you have not in common. And through that process, you can work together to find a compromise because we all live in this community together. So finding the compromise through talking to each other and listening is one of the most important things we can do. Thank you to all the candidates for their responses to that very long question. I'd like to remind people in the audience that we do have uh, index cards coming around if you uh, find yourself with a question you'd like to have answered. Uh, these are, after all, your candidates for your county council positions, so please do feel free to send those up. Um, and on that note, I want to take the next question from an audience card, um, and I want to begin with Mr. Jack Wilson. I believe it's your turn. Um, when, in one minute, will you continue to support the Clean Chesapeake Coalition, and why or why not? Absolutely. Um, and for one reason, and, and I know there's a lot of skepticism about what the Clean Chesapeake Coalition, uh, their initial mission was, um, and the cost to each county, but based on the results, which uh, I think came to a head last year when the governor, uh, using the Clean Chesapeake Coalition as his backing, went forward with an RFP to look at uh, proposed ways of dredging behind the Conowingo, um, looking at where, what can be done with the spoils, um, and to actually do something about uh, the mess that's there. It's been since, I believe, 1972 was the last time that that uh, area was dredged behind there. We've seen, just in the last five years, well, after we go back to 11, to Tropical Storm Lee, we've seen probably about six different events with, which have adversely affected the bay. Um, just this year, when we got that six and a half, seven inches of rain, we lost a $20 million industry here in the white clam business. And we can't keep going forward like that in Queen Anne's County. Our watermen are doing their job, our farmers are doing their job, and the Clean Chesapeake Coalition will help us. So. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Tillman. I think things like the Clean uh, Chesapeake Coalition are excellent uh, mechanisms to help clean up the bay. The important thing with these sorts of coalitions is to make sure they're effectively managed and to make sure they're effectively utilized. And I would support any organization with the goal of making the Chesapeake Bay a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Mr. Moran? You know, when, it, when we first joined a Ch Clean Chesapeake Coalition four, probably four, excuse me, maybe five years ago, um, you know, one of the big issues was there was a side that said, no, don't waste money with the Clean Chesapeake Coalition, and the other side saying yes, and I said, why can't we do both? And we can. I mean, it, you know, as we t sit in this room and, and talk to, you know, every all the stakeholders, you know, we have a duty to keep our waterways clean, our storm drains, our, our rivers and creeks stream, and, and keep the pollutions out of those. But that's really all for naught if constantly opening up 6 to 12 to 20 floodgates inundates the, the upper Chesapeake Bay and lower Chesapeake Bay with sediment and kills everything, just like it did with, like you said, the white claim. So, you know, I, I, I'm in support of that, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mrs. Kruger? Yes, I agree with everybody else. I would be in support of it. There's power in numbers. Um, working with the state government, we do need to hold those other states accountable. The Chesapeake um, 
Clean Water Blueprint actually has um, violation codes, and if you're not held, if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, you should be fined, you should be punished, and that's written into that blueprint. And so we do need to look to those other states to do what they need to do, and we do need to support the governor in that, and we do need to support each other in that. So yes, I would, I would stay in that and support it. Thank you, ma'am. As a reminder to the audience, we're asking the candidates to answer the question of whether they would continue to support the Clean Chesapeake Coalition. Mrs. Harrison, one minute, please. Uh, yes. Um, right now, we, we need all of our partners to come together. Uh, we need Pennsylvania. We need New York. We need the state of Maryland. We need the Clean um, Coalition. We also need the Chesapeake Bay Foundation to all sit down and work together and find those points of moderation and move forward there. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Dubino, one minute. Um, uh, yes. Uh, for obvious reasons that the other candidates have uh, shared with us, uh, I would support the Clean Chesapeake Coalition. It was our administration that actually uh, agreed to join it for the first time. Um, uh, Candidate Harrison makes a good point that um, we have to hold these other states, as I mentioned, accountable um, for the lack of effort on their part. You know, we do great things down here in the Chesapeake Bay watershed communities only to take a couple steps backwards because the folks up north aren't held to the same standards that we are. So I think the Clean Chesapeake Coalition will, will bring us a, a place at the table and hold them accountable. Thank you very much. Mr. Coulter, one minute. By the time he gets here, it's slim pickings. <laughs> we will eventually rotate back around where you get the first crack at the question. The answer is yes to your question. The more information, the more power we can get collectively on these environmental issues, the better off we are. Uh, by, by putting the coalition together uh, and addressing the issues certainly makes our, our, uh, our, our data, our information, and our, our collaborative uh, uh, input uh, more strong. So, yes. Thank you, sir. Mr. Corcorino? I feel like I should say no just to liven up the table. Right. <laughs> Everybody agreeing here. Uh, but the answer is yes, and I'll save you all my hot air. I, I agree with you. Most people here have already said thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wilson. I'm going to go back to what I talked to before. It's not just uh, Maryland is in, in a pickle because we have a very few miles of the Susquehanna River. But the Susquehanna River is the principal greatest contributor to pollution in the Chesapeake Bay. And there's no way that this mess with the day is going to be cleaned up if we don't put the arm on Pennsylvania, as that nice gentleman in the blue shirt out there noted a minute ago. He uh, acknowledged, I think, that what we need to do is create political force in the Congress, in the Senate, which is where these interstate agreements are made. That's the way to get this done. It has to be done through Chesapeake Coalition are helping them, but they they need our help too. We need to go directly to our congressmen and senators and really put the arm on them. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Apologies to all the candidates for what must seem an unbearable wait before we get to you. This is a really long and elaborate round robin play. It's a, a bit of wait before you get to the Monday night game, as it were. So thank you all for your patience this evening. Um, Sticking with water quality issues for at least one more question. Uh, development of the phase three watershed implementation plans is scheduled to begin this fall with significant input from stakeholders around the county. Um, in your opinion, what worked well with the phase two WIP process before? What needs to be modified and what should the county do to support the development of a robust phase three WIP? And Mr. Tillman, the first answer goes to you. I think the problem with with all these sorts of questions is to make sure that we have good science, that we understand the results that we've seen from phase one and phase two, and before we decide what we're gonna do on phase three. And I think adhering to a plan simply because that's the way we did it is probably not productive. If the plan needs to be modified or we need to adjust it as we go forward, then we should do so. But in this case, the input really has to be good sound science. And I think sometimes, uh, I remember as a youngster reading a book and the title was How to Lie with Statistics. And you know, you can, you can make the answer whatever you want, but responsible science addresses that issue and it's not gonna happen. Uh, 
I think the problem with the watershed implementation plan is that it's gotten such a bad rap in some areas that people become confused as to actually what it will and won't do. I, I support WIP. Thank you very much. Mr. Moran. I'm going to piggyback right onto what he said because that, that was a well-rounded answer. As an original member of the Healthy Waters Roundtable, uh, I participated with the Eastern Shore Counties and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation with establishing critical areas of assistance necessary, such as the Watershed Implementation Plan, the WIP, funding for stormwater retrofit, water and wastewater facility planning and resources, and issues related to funding for agricultural preservation. So, you know, uh, piggybacking on what he said, he, he's absolutely right, and, and I think to take that further, it's going to come down to funding, and right now, Queen Anne's County is on the cusp of the MS4 permit, which we are in court right now about it, just because we need a little time to to build up to take on that big chunk of cheese because it's going to be about ten million dollars. So, you know, we're working our way into it. So, I'm in agreement with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Moran. Mrs. Kruger. Sorry, I didn't realize I was um, So, keeping in mind that Maryland expect is actually expected to fall short of some of its um, milestones by 2025. We've already um, updated most of our wastewater treatment plants throughout the state, and so we can't rely on those anymore. We need to really come back to agriculture, make sure that um, farmers in the area have their funding that they need. There's some more money available to them in the flush tax um, to help them with cover crops, and we need to really address the issue of um, stormwater management. Thank you, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. Harrison. Hi. Um, I think we're, we're making good progress towards our goals, but we still have a lot of work that we can do to improve. And um, it, it's going to come down to all of us having a, a part in the solutions that face the Bay, whether it's uh, the stormwater management that we can do or, you know, keeping your rain gardens clean, uh, helping our farmers go after the grants that they need to do the things that they can do. We can do more, and we need to start aggressively pursuing other options as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Dumino, one minute. Um, I have to confess um, that um, I'm not completely up to date on the phases and, and, and where we stand as far as meeting our, our reductions. Um, I will go back to saying that, however, we do have a, a, a fantastic WIP team made up of uh, folks with a tremendous amount of experience that are monitoring and, and the areas that we are finding that we are weak at that we need to improve on. Uh, I have a great deal of faith that they're going to make sure that the, uh, the necessary fixes to reach our uh, reductions by 2025 will be met. And I hope that, um, that we're able to make those. Thank you, Mr. Dumino. Mr. Coulter. Well, I think, I think that we, as, as stated, further down the line, we've, we've made a lot of, lot of good progress, uh, basically uh, with our wastewater treatment plants, uh, getting the, the nutrients out of, our, uh, out of the, uh, the result of the wastewater treatment process. I think that the harder pro problem is, is stormwater management, where we have to make sure that farmers use the best practices. Uh, farmers want to use the best practices because it makes sense for them. Uh, but uh, we need to, to work with the farmers using best practices for, for water runoff. Uh, we need to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that construction is monitored and inspection so we don't have massive runoffs of sediment into the bay. Uh, and um, we're in the right direction. We need to continue that march. Again, as a reminder to the audience, the question is what worked well with the phase two WIP process? What needs to be modified? and what should the county do to support the development of a robust phase three WIP? Mr. Corcorino, the question to you in one minute, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, rehash a lot of what's already been said. Um, as I said earlier, I think the commissioners have already done a great job with that. The Southern Canal and sewer system alone, 30,000 uh, pounds of nitrogen production right there, one third of our, of our WIP goal, that, that's pretty amazing. Um, I think something going forward that we need to focus more on, though, is education, not just outreach for the farmers, as it has been mentioned, but just education to the public in general. I think if you go to the man on the street and you ask him about whip, if they think that you're talking about something that you might use if you're riding a horse at the Preakness. Um, so I think that you, you need to get out there and educate them as to what programs are coming, the costs are going to come up from the MS4, so they understand that. Um, I think 
when Southern Kent Island Sewer was going on, a lot of people didn't understand the, the benefit that we were going to get for the WIP. Um, so better education for the public, I think, will help the commissioners to be able to do what they need to do to comply. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steve Wilson, one minute to you, sir. Yes, sir. So we have funded millions of dollars in the WIP, and I think that as this thing moves forward and we trans transfer ourselves into the next stage or two, it's going to be how this money really gets run out that counts. And I want to make a point, which is Mr. Moran's point, not mine, having to do with uh, <coughs> the fact that the county has not allowed this point to skip away from him. And I'm going to give, I'm going to cede my time to him to talk about solar and how we should get credit for solar. Well, what, he, what he's referring to is uh, yeah. the Eastern Shore is, is, is ripe for solar array farms. And one of the things those farms do is, is your best, some of your best management practices are based on 25 year cycles. Solar arrays are based on 20 year, 25 year cycles also. One acre of farmland puts down about uh, two tons, is it uh, two tons of chicken manure, not to mention other fertilizers. When it gets transferred over into uh, solar arrays, why don't those farmers, because you know, in, this, in the state you, you, sub, you divide farming from, from everything else when it comes to whip points, and why don't those farmers get credit towards whip goals in reduction of the nitrogen which is in that chicken manure and phosphorus and, and sediment runoff when that grass grows? And if you look at it, we've got a, a goal of around 2,000 acres of solar arrays, so just keep that in mind. Thank you. I guess I'm going to take a different tact here. Um, the, the biggest problem I see with phase two, phase three, phase one, phase nine is it, it's an endless football field. There's no goal line. Um, the state has continued to kick the can down the road on what our goals are. So as we finish up phase two, and as a county, Queen Anne's County being a small county, like Commissioner Moran mentioned, we're going to hit, get hit with a, a, probably a bill of around 10 to $12 million, and that's going to be cash projects to uh, do stormwater management on Kent Island. But the, the issue at hand is the same one that I've been dealing with with Sam Owings on his project in North County. The state's not taking the plan and actually implementing all parts of it, which was the nutrient trading credits, which would benefit the farmers. There was credits for the watermen. There's all kinds of other things that are supposed to be wrapped up into this whip that have never been implemented. So my biggest thing going forward with phase three is let's implement what was in phase two to make phase three better. And I support the whip. I'm just saying the, the state really needs to give us a goal line to run across because again, we have one of the largest whip projects in the state of Maryland in the Southern Kent Island sewer and it's been nationally recognized for it, so. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Following up on uh, Mr. Moran's comments and Mr. Wilson's uh, gentle punt to, to Mr. Mr. Moran. Um, solar electricity development is something I think we should talk about. It's a double-edged sword for rural communities represents a component of economic growth, helps build resilience and self-reliance, but it also consumes land. We are more susceptible to that pressure here than our urban neighbors who consume more power. Uh, what policies do you propose or support to strike the proper balance between solar development, preservation of the rural landscape, economic development, land value, and residents' concerns about appearance? And Mr. Moran, I believe the first minute goes to you. Excellent, okay, so that's a good question. And it's a lot of that we've already answered. Uh, we took, uh, basically, uh, if you notice, if you travel 301 North, there's a brand new power, or an upgraded power grid there. Uh, the county has selected that, it, it, I think it's for two miles, two miles or yeah, two miles on either side of that uh, main grid is the only place these large solar arrays can go because it has to be able to get the power to the grid. And then we've, we've, we took a census of all the surrounding Eastern Shore counties and Western Shore counties to find out because if, you, if those of you don't know, uh, Governor, Governor O'Malley implemented a, a scale where you have to have so much of your energy has to be renewable energy. And the cleanest renewable energy we have is solar. So there is a push for that. There's, there's federal and state assistance to build these, and that's why they were coming out of the woodwork. We put a 2,000 acre cap for the you know, Queen Anne's County, which is similar to what all of our neighboring counties have. What we're trying to push for is, remember, it's, if it's on agriculture, it's, it's a structure that has to keep a bond so that if this, someday that, that structure's got to be taken down. So it, it, we don't lose that farmland, we just set it aside for 25 years. Mr. Moran, thank you very much. Mrs. Kruger, one minute to you. Well, I'm going <laughs> to take what he said and agree with him because he could say it way better than I can. 
I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not an expert in solar energy. Um, what I would tell you is that I, just like I said previously, I would do my due diligence to find out all the information that I can. I would talk to the experts. I would listen to the, their opinions. I would listen to their advice. I would give thoughtful, thoughtful, thoughtful consideration to the plans that were presented um, to me, and I would go forward from there. Thank you, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. Harrison. I put solar panels on my roof in 2009, and I absolutely love them. I, I would encourage more residential rooftops. Um, there's no farmland that has to be set aside at all then. The farms can be producing food while my rooftop can produce energy. Um, the, as far as the aesthetics of the solar panel arrays, I, I find that the uh, farm fields are a lot prettier without them in it. And I've never really understood the aesthetic qualities of shingles, so cover up your roofs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. Mr. Dumino, one minute to you. Um, one of the first solar ray fields that was uh, erected uh, was on Safety Road um, in our administration. And the benefits of that solar ray field on Safety Road has generated enough power um, for six county buildings since we put that in and an annual savings in electrical cost close to $300,000 a year. So if you ask me what my feelings are about solar array fields, um, I'm for them. Um, although I'd like to see the opportunity if possible that, that perhaps maybe to meet the aesthetic distaste that some folks have, uh, perhaps maybe set them further off the road, uh, perhaps maybe with buffers or something. Thank you, Mr. Dumino. Mr. Coulter, question to you. Well, I'm not part of the slate. I actually agree with some of what was said here. I, I actually, I've gone to a number of, of, of zoning meetings, and uh, a number of the meetings had to do with, uh, with various uh, solar uh, farms. I think the county does a good job there. I think the county does do a good job of setting buffers so that uh, the, the, the field is aesthetically pleasing as you drive by. I think the, the, the county does a good job of, of setting the bonds to make sure that they do what they say they're going to do. And, uh, and I'm in an uncomfortable position of agreeing with what Mr. Moran just said. Get used to it. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Mr. Corcorino, I'm um, admitted to you, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm in a comfortable position of agreeing with what Mr. Moran said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very good, counsel. <laughs> um, look, solar's a clean energy. Uh, Commissioner uh, Stephen Wilson was talking earlier about a recent report that came out uh, about global warming. I think it was about two days ago when this report came out, and they were talking about that we're looking at the the temperature of the ocean increasing by about what, another 2.5 degrees um, in just the next 12 years, which is a staggering increase of what we've had in this the last 100 years, um, and that is going to have rising tides probably put about 10 million dollar 10 million lives at risk if that if that occurred. One of the, the, the issues that's raised in that report is the uh, coal being used in there. They're calling for reducing the coal by one third. The only way we can do that is with solar. So I'm in favor of us uh, contributing to a renewable resource. Thank you, Mr. Corcorino. Mr. Steve Wilson, a question to you, sir. Well, you heard everybody say we did a good job, and I think we did. Uh, when we got into this some years ago, <coughs> All of us commissioners had leaned on the zoning department very hard to make sure that the worst aspect of solar was a sort of visual clutter. It's like a giant trailer park. Uh, and what we did was to insist that the buffers of sufficient height and width and, and density were created and bonded, and we are very uh, stringent about doing that. The nice thing about solar is I don't think it's going to last here forever. I think uh, other technologies will come and underneath the solar still exists the good farmland and an afternoon with a bulldozer would clean up a whole solar operation. So I think that the well-being of the planet is being preserved with solar and little destruction done. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jack Wilson? One yeah, I agree with uh, Steve and Jim's comments about it. It's, with this commission, we, we hit it head on because we were the first county to actually come up with a comprehensive uh, planning and zoning plan to address solar setbacks um, and basically aesthetically how it was going to look. And 
we, uh, we put together a uh, personal property tax for the solar to not necessarily deter it, but to make sure that that farmland being out of commission for 30 years, there was going to still be uh, uh, quality income coming back off of that uh, unused farmland. Um, and now it's basically become the model for the other shore counties and some of the Western Maryland counties. So it's something that as a commissioner on here, I'm very proud of that we were able to uh, spearhead that. So, Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Tillman, question to you. Uh, I'm a big fan of solar power. Uh, I used to fly a small plane and you'd be surprised at how much uh, solar panels there are in the county. And they are very well hidden. I must compliment the commissioners on that. Uh, they're places I never would have thought I'd seen them. As somebody whose heart really is in the farmland, it's, it's difficult for me to give up that farmland for solar panels. Uh, for one thing, you know, I don't think the impact of the uh, materials and chemicals that we put on that acre, uh, I'd say it's absolutely minimized. We put cover crops out. I mean, it's not causing any problem. Uh, and it is an impermeable surface to some extent. There's some drawbacks to the finances too. I think you have to look very carefully at them. Everybody talks about how much money they save, but we don't often hear about what the investment was or what the ROI is. And I think it's important to consider that. Uh, but doing your homework properly, I think it's an excellent solution. And I certainly applaud the notion that at its technologically end, we can revert to farmland. Thank you. A follow-on question, not from this audience, but from the group that I pulled earlier this afternoon. And Mrs. Kruger, the first question is to you. Um, do you support granting WIP credit for the installation of solar arrays on agricultural land? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's the question that you start with me. <laughs> Many apologies. Um, so WIP credits as are very complicated to understand. Could you repeat the question for me, please, so I can get my... Sure. Do you support the, the granting of WIP credit for the installation of solar arrays on agricultural land? Yes, I do. I'm going to leave it at that. Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. Harrison? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I, I think that we should be giving credit as a county to interchange, if it's ski or if it's a farming practice or a solar array, it should all count towards the county's overall burden. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Dumino, question yes. to you. Yes, um, reiterating what um, Commissioner Wilson, Jack Wilson said earlier about, you know, having an end zone to cross over. Um, and I think uh, establishing WIP credits uh, to programs um, that deserve them should certainly be uh, consideration and, and, and solar arrays, in my opinion, uh, should deserve web credits. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coulter, question to you. Do you support- I'm gonna have fun to say no. Um, and, and it's an interesting question and I haven't contemplated it before, but it seems to me that, uh, that the solar program is almost an economic Kind of program especially when when we're leasing it to or are proving it for a farmer to produce income for instead of putting crops down so why would we want to give an incentive to someone who's already getting money for for the, for the project so i'm going to say no there you go <laughs> mr coulter mr corcorino question to you um, I, I would agree with the whip credit. I, something I would want to uh, evaluate further, uh, but just hearing that question from for the first time today it seems to me that it makes a lot of sense. Mr. Steve Wilson, question to you, sir. The proper answer ought to be I have no idea. Um, but the facts are this that a few years ago, 40 or 50 percent of the electricity in the United States was generated with coal. It's the most destructive thing you can do. It's just awful. And natural gas has now eroded a lot of that production, but it's still over 20%. And anything we can do to get rid of coal out of the, out of the atmosphere and reducing the nitrogen and the CO2 has got to be done. So anything you can do to push anything, particularly if you could get something in battery technology so the solar didn't wind up just feeding the grid in the day when the big loads are in the early morning and night. All those things are super helpful, so that's my thought. 
Thank you, sir. Mr. Jack Wilson? Yes, um, yes, I agree. And the reason is to, uh, I guess, to, to help Jim out on what the WIPs actually all about runoff. And when you put solar panels there, you're taking 25 years of nitrogen and phosphorus runoff and keeping it out of the bay and the waterways. So that's the, what a WIP's supposed to do. So I say if you're putting solar there and it will contain that runoff because it's slightly pervious, but it's, it's not impervious by no means and the grass will grow underneath of it, but it won't require fertilization. So you've basically taken fertilization out of land for 25 years. I believe we should get WIP credit for that because that's a nitrogen and phosphorus reduction in the bay, and that's what the WIP plan is supposed to be doing. So, Thank you, sir. Mr. Tillman? No. <laughs> and in part because uh, I do tend to differ with some of the comments earlier that just because it's farmland, you shouldn't jump to the conclusion that tons of nitrogen are flowing into the bay. We use good farming practices on our farm, and I know other farmers that do, and we are very, very careful about the load that we put on our land. And uh, we plant cover crops, and a solar array generates a lot of impermeable surface. If anything, I think it uh, runs counter to the goals of the WIP. And uh, to me, it's sort of a non sequitur. The question puzzles me. I can't really figure out what one's got to do with the other, and I don't think it should have anything to do with each other. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moran? Well, I, I, I don't know where the science says yes, absolutely, support whip credits, because those farms are putting that chicken manure on them. They are putting other chemicals on them, and they are having sediment runoff. Solar panels, it's been proven. They, they don't require any fertilizer whatsoever. So even if you had your best management practice, you know and I know and everybody in this room knows farmers are still getting hit with so many tons of pollution coming off their farms. Now, if you're not going to give credit for the farmers, why are we giving credit to the Southern Kent Island sewer for getting rid of that nitrogen out of that soil? I mean, absolutely agree with it. And, you know, the state split up and these farmers, we always go to the farmers first. The farmers are the ones doing the pollution. We always go to the farmers. I, I disagree with that. I think that, yeah, absolutely would, would support with credit for those farmers. Thank you very much. Again, a reminder to the audience, if you have questions you'd like to see answered, uh, we are passing around index cards. <laughs> Hillary has both cards and pens, so please feel free to bring your, your questions forward. Um, from this audience, and Mrs. Harrison, the question is to you. Um, plastic and styrofoam are plaguing the planet, and most plastics are not recyclable. Given that Queen Anne's County is dependent on clean water for hunting, angling, tourism, and other industries, what will you do to ensure we are pursuing plastic reduction strategies? Start within our, our own government agencies. Um, <coughs> reduce where we can what we can. Um, look around at <coughs> different um, programs. We have the Ken Island Beach cleanups. They have really done an amazing job of bringing awareness to the problem. To, um, and educating our children on it as well. So um, continuing to put the pressure on commercial interests to reduce their single-use plastics. I don't think I'd want to regulate it at this point, but I'd like to continue to encourage the pressure that's out there. Um, I'd also like to see us do some things that um, some of our storm drains and things like that, they have the mesh bags that you know, we can put over them to start collecting some of that uh, trash before it actually gets out into the bay. And um, I think that's a pretty, pretty innovative idea. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. Mr. Dumino, question to you. So I think it's safe to say that the folks from the uh, Ken Island Beach cleanup would love it if the day came that they walked the beaches with the bags and the volunteers and didn't find any six-pack plastic containers. Um, can you imagine, you know, going with something that's biodegradable, that if it did um, unfortunately reach our waterways, that it would dissolve? Um, I think there's some science that we can um, use to approach some of the issues to get rid of some of these single stream plastic. Um, I'm not a big fan of driving down the road and seeing the, the grocery store plastic bags stuck in a tree and, and whipping like a flat. So, you know, I, I, but um, I, I'd really like to see the problem addressed at a, at a state and even a federal level with, um, with restrictions on, on where these single stream plastics are used. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Mr. Coulter, question to you. What, will you. what would you do to ensure we are pursuing plastic reduction strategies? 
Well, I think it's a very important issue, and I think it is a local issue. I think that uh, Queen Anne's County, uh, we're very proud of, being, of our proximity to the bay, we're very proud of our streams, we're very proud of our estuaries. And when we do go out and, we, and, and work with the, the, the beach cleanup folks, we, we come back with bags and bags and bags of this stuff. And there's no reason for it. Really, there is no reason for it, or perhaps economic. So wh what I would be in favor for is to go out and talk to the, talk to the retailers and, that, uh, and the restaurants that use pla uh, plastic bags, understand their economics, but at some, and, and try to jawbone everybody into, you know, and or shaming them into going back to, to paper versus plastic, go back to paper. At some point, though, we got to take a hard stand. If this is an important issue to us, if it's something we should do, and if, if we can't, you know, cause them to make a change on their own, there's got to be some kind of local legislation about paper versus plastic. Thank you, sir. Mr. Corcorino? Yeah. It's funny, my, um, last night my 11-year-old daughter uh, was making a list of the different types of single-use plastics that she could, and her friends get together to have the elementary school band. Um, they were inspired by going and see the sculpture from the Canal Beach Clubs, the spoils of their, of their efforts. Um, I, I think what, what that shows is that we are making progress through, through awareness and through programs like that. Um, I think that's the better way is through education and incentives. Um, I'm not a fan of creating more regulations that will hamper businesses. I think if you have a business that they want to ban straws and they promote that and that will drive more customers to them, that's the capitalist way to do it. Um, I think that's going to have a much more effective result. When you force people to do things, they look for loopholes, they fight it, they resist it. When you incentivize them to do things, they get on board with it. And you need people to get on board. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steve Wilson. Yeah, I think these last two gentlemen got exactly the point. This political business isn't the simplest thing in the world. Because you can think you're going to lead somebody, and the next thing you find out, you're at the front of the parade, but nobody's following you. So you basically have a need to develop the sense of where you can get the public to go. And I have already met with some ladies that wanted to ban plastic bags from the supermarket, and were asking whether the commissioners would be susceptible to that. And we met with uh, with uh, Mr. Falstead and the. Uh, Queen Anne County uh, conservation folks and we're talking about these kind of things but you can't do it till you get the public susceptible to doing it you can't you can't lead people beyond their capacity so as soon as we can get on to doing these things we would sure like to do them thank you thank you sir mr. Wilson because I've been asked this question a few times I'm gonna take a different tact on it. I'm, I'm gonna go down the personal responsibility out of that. Um, so often, we try to regulate and take government and change everything to make everybody uh, do something a certain way because we have certain people that aren't responsible. And let's face it, when I'm at home, I don't use a straw to drink any of my drinks at home. So I don't need it when I go out. So I personally can make that choice. And I also, if I'm walking down the street and I see litter on the street, I will pick it up and put it in the nearest trash receptacle. So, you know, I love what KIBCU does with awareness. But guess what? Everybody in this room, if you went on your personal effects right now, you have more plastic on your body or underneath of your seat right now than you're ever going to do. So it's not going to go away. But I believe with awareness and making people and the kids nowadays realizing the trash on the street shouldn't be there. I mean, I drive up in Baltimore City. It's one of the sickest places in the world to drive through and, and work because it, it, it really does. It's sick of me to see it. Um, and then when I go out on the beach cleanups and I see it there, again, it sickens me. But I do it. If everybody made an effort to do it, it would be a lot cleaner. So I'm going with the personal responsibility versus the regulatory. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tillman, one minute to you, sir. I have a couple of observations. One is McDonald's years ago was putting Big Macs in styrofoam containers. <coughs> and through public pressure and public awareness, McDonald's made a business decision which doesn't seem to have hurt their business at all to put them in paper-based biodegradable containers. Uh, the economics have to be there, unfortunately. Uh, I pick up trash every morning when I walk, and it keeps coming back. I don't know who the people are who <laughs> do it, but they do. Uh, 
the other thing that's always mystified me is why Maryland and other states on the Chesapeake Bay don't have a bottle bill. Massachusetts put it in amidst howls of protest from the distributors, and it was a great success. In the end, there was a ton of money left over from unclaimed deposits, and the bottlers wanted that back, having opposed the bill in the first place. Uh, so <laughs> there's some benefits to everybody there. And I think it's those sort of solutions. Uh, I think Steve's got it right when he says you have to get the public engaged. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moran, one minute to you, sir. Okay, I'm going to say I agree with everybody's comments up here, 100%. <laughs> what I want to talk about is where we are in Queen Anne's County with recycling. Queen Anne's County with recycling right now, if you don't know this, I can get this through in a minute, Talbot County, Queen Anne's County, and Caroline County share in trash removal. Started in Talbot County for the first 20 years, went to Caroline County for the next 20 years, and then it's coming to Queen Anne's County for the, for the following 20 years. What we don't, what we didn't figure back when this started was the amount of recycle that would be going on. And we are ahead of what, all of our mandates and all of our uh, estimates in recycling. So what that means is Caroline County's landfill will have seven years of life left on it when they close it. And that's a travesty to me. So that the following seven years after, after it reaches the 20 year, pays off its debt, those seven years can be cash positive for Caroline County. There's not more land on the Eastern Shore as we all know. So to close a landfill before it's at capacity is just, to me, it's just a travesty. So one of the things we are trying to work on is to continue with Caroline County to work with them to, to take that landfill to capacity. So when it comes to Queen Anne's County, again, it'll be budgeted for 20 years. If it goes past 20 years, it's a cash flow positive. We fill it to capacity and move on. Thank you. Mrs. Kruger, one minute to you. Um, so obviously I agree with everybody here. I read somewhere today that 73% of the garbage that's uh, collected off of the uh, coastline is from plastics. So obviously I'm not necessarily in favor of regulating it through legislation, but I'm in public education. I believe in educating people, educate, educate, educate. The sculpture um, completed by Ken Island Beach Cleanups is an awesome opportunity to educate the kids in our county about the effects of single use plastic and I applaud them for doing that. Plastic Free Queen Anne's County as well has um, started up a great program and educating people on, on those as well. So I would work with private um, nonprofit organizations and, and as a government um, <coughs> official and just bring education to the county. I think that's where we start. I believe that reaches the end of the of that round of the round robin. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, wanted to make sure. All right. Well, thank you all for your answers. A follow-up question also from this audience. Um, quickly, what is your position on a five-cent fee for plastic bags or a five-cent credit for reusable bags? Mr. Duman, a question to you. So um, it gets back to what a lot of my colleagues here at the table were discussing um, on the first part of the question about um, uh, awareness and education. So. Um, when you incentivize people to do something that's uh, inevitably long-term going to be good for them, um, it, it's, it, it could only have positive results. So um, I would say, yeah, um, at, at least the recycling component, you know, for glass or plastic, um, incentivize them with, um, uh, with um, money. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coulter, your question. <coughs> I feel like asking you to repeat the question so I can think about it some more. Um, I, I, yeah, let me take a glass of water. Are you mind the clock? I actually don't think it's a good idea. I, th I think that, uh, that uh, them so there's some elements of the earlier argument about, you know, people just have to understand what their responsibility is. We all are good citizens. We need to behave as good citizens. Uh, and if and my argument, if you just if if it is not an econ a huge economic burden to the retailers, to the restaurateurs, et cetera, et cetera, to go back with with paper, if if uh, uh, then there's good reason to say we don't use paper plastic or we don't use plastic here in in Queen Anne's County. So I don't think we need incentives. We need to come to that decision about how we're going to handle it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Corcorino, your question. Um, as I said in my prior answer, I'm not a fan of those kind of regulations. I'd rather get people on board. Um, I, I think when you 
start creating more and more regulations, what that does is that helps big businesses because they can absorb it, they can put <coughs> policies into place, and it hurts smaller businesses, it hurt businesses that are trying to start. Uh, at the uh, Exxon gas station on Canal, if you guys haven't been there, there's a little yellow trailer. They make the best tacos, right? I encourage you to go there, right? Yeah. You see a lot of gym signs there, you see a whole bunch of signs there. <laughs> These two well sound <laughs> ladies run it. Um, they're able to do that because they scaled back to this trailer and get started and, and focus on making an excellent product. And as a result, they got a lot of people come there. Now, what if we add a regulation? Now they have to worry about do they credit five cents, not credit five cents. They're just trying to make a quick lunch business as quick as they can. And then you're going to add more and more regulations on them. So from that perspective, I'm not a fan of those things because I want to see small businesses start in Queens County so they can grow in Queens County. And I think regulations, they don't hurt big businesses, but they hurt small businesses. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steve Wilson, question to you, sir. I'm considering. You're awake? Yeah, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm happy to use it up with silence. <laughs> no, it's considering the, uh, the business of plastic bags, and, and what I said before was we had come into a consideration of whether to try to write some kind of regulation. And the point of it was that at this point, we didn't think that the public was susceptible to that. I think they're going to be pretty quickly. I think the times are changing and the education level and the susceptibility to going through some difficulties uh, <clears throat> in, order to, in order to get what you want done is going to happen more quickly than we think. So I, I think the public will come along and we'll be able to, to a combination, write some legislation and do what the public wants. Thank you, sir. A reminder to the audience briefly, we're considering uh, candidates' positions on a five cent fee for plastic bags or a five cent credit for reusable bags. Mr. Jack Wilson, your question. I would say that I would be willing to listen to it, but I would not want to sit up here today and promise one way or the other how I would uh, proceed forward. I, I say it could be something that goes deep in the weeds because first off, how is, in, how is enforcement done, things like that, I mean, you know, uh, but I would certainly want to sit down and listen to a proposal and how it will work and to talk speak to Chris's point to how is it going to affect businesses small businesses big business things like that this is just one of the ones you're talking about a fee a tax whatever you want to call it that again you, you need to look at from all angles before you would just sit up here and rubber stamp it as a great idea so that would be my take on it thank you sir Mr. Tillman your question I, I'm cautious about it. I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea, but I think a better solution is public awareness. Uh, for one thing, I think the retail businesses aren't going to be real happy about the bookkeeping involved. And uh, secondly, there are people in this county that that extra <coughs> dollar a week is going to hurt. And they don't have good alternatives. They might not be able to provide a reusable bag. And I think these are people that we tend to sometimes forget. Uh, I've been canvassing in Suttersville and Churchill, and I was surprised. I was educated, I'll put it that way, when I saw some of the people there. And I was just thinking about what a dollar a week would do to them. And uh, so I, I agree with Commissioner Wilson, comma Jack, that it's something worth consideration, but <clears throat> I'm not particularly supportive of the idea. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moran, question to you. One minute, please. You know, it's funny. This is the whole reason we're here. Governing is tough decisions. It is. And you're thinking about a plastic bag and, and what you're going to do with it. I'd get rid of the five cents for or against it. Just outlaw the bags. Outlaw the plastic straws because you can do paper straws, you can do paper cups. I mean, we live with all the shorelines, one of the, one of the most heavily shorelined counties in everything, in any street, goes into a culvert and it's sooner away it works its way into our rivers and in our bay so you know i think that somewhere along the line you, you you've got to say you know to, to the public what do you want to do and and i think that i don't think that that would be to and i understand the small business portion of it so maybe you phase it in but it, it warrants discussion and i don't have a problem with just saying you know let's move forward and, and get it on the books thank you sir mrs kruger question to you one minute please so I, I agree with that as well. It's definitely something that I would um, consider, but I, I take Ben's um, statement into account. I work in a Title I school, and I know that money is tight for many, many, many people. And like Ben said, you have to take that into consideration. But I, I go back to I think education is, 
is the best thing to do. Go into businesses, educate them on um, on how it affects the bay, educate our students, educate adults. I mean, they've been outside grocery stores handing out um, canvas bags. Like I said, government entities and private entities working together, I think that that right now is, is what I would feel comfortable with. Thank you, ma'am. Mrs. Harrison, question to you. You know, about five, six years ago, the county had a problem with trashy beaches. Our government solution at that time was to charge a beach permit fee to be able to use our beach. Didn't clean our beaches. All it did was tax our citizens. Luckily, it's been repealed. Um, I think we need to do more positive things to encourage folks to get off of their plastic bags, use their canvas totes. They're giving away canvas totes at every event, even Anthony's run yesterday. They were handing out free reusable bags. Continue the, to encourage it. I don't want to see government regulating it because we, we might not be, we can regulate Queen Anne County, we can't regulate all the traffic that comes across this bay with all of their fast food containers and plastics and things like that that do get tossed out the windows. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Farley, real quick, if I might, since the question started with me. Um, I, I wanted to make clear in my answer, because uh, the question truly was two-part. Uh, would you be in favor of, of regulating a fee for using plastic or, re, uh, or issuing some sort of deposit um, where it's turned back in and you can receive financial benefit from, from uh, recycling the plastic. So again, what I'm in favor of is, a, is some sort of recycling uh, reimbursement program. That, that I would be in favor of. Um, but to regulate businesses and, and, uh, and charge them for using plastic bags, that was the other part of the question that, that I'm certainly not in favor of. Thank you. In the spirit of fair play and even handedness, are there other candidates who might wish to take a 30 second moment to modify a stance? Well, I could fill my silence up by announcing that we have paper here. Um, the plastic That's not this I stand by my no. <laughs> I think everybody has almost made the point that I made in my short soliloquy here that. You have to wait for the public to get there. If we'd had this discussion 10 years ago, nobody would like it. I think five years from now, everybody's gonna want it and you may not have to have fees, but they may lead the way. It's hard to know. That's it. Other voices? Hearing none, we'll move on. Thank you. For the <laughs> eighth question of the evening, I believe we'll leave with you, Mr. Coulter, finally. Um, from this audience, uh, somebody would like, to, would like you to comment on the value of preserved natural spaces, not simply preserved ag agricultural land or developed land. All right. I, th I think they're, they're, that, that part of our, our planning for, for Queen Anne's County and part of the prior year's planning, the years before, had, had project open space where where either we, through the through the state we're able to get open space, or through our planning we're able to designate an open space. I think it's a very very important thing. I think that uh, that it allows us to uh, to create uh, and demise communities with uh, with trees and valleys and and, uh, and and natural spaces that are very very important, and they're very much part of the character of our county. So I would encourage that kind of planning in the future to continue to plan open space, unused open space for its, its own natural beauty to, to enhance our community and, and enhance our experience of living here in Queen Anne's County. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Mr. Corcorino, your question. Yeah. I think I, I understand the question is, uh, are we in favor of the Sorry. question simply asks you to comment on it. Yeah, okay. Does it ask you to take a position? Okay, um, well, so I, I grew up playing out in the woods and in creeks and hunting for tadpoles and 
with my friends creating forts out in the trees. I, I think that those untamed spaces are what allow a child's imagination to run wild. I, I think we need more of that. I think we need them off of tablets and out in the woods experimenting and exploring. So I'm in favor of Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steve Wilson, question to you, sir. I think Queen Anne County actually has done a fabulous job. In 1990, we had zero county parks. We have 17 county parks now, which are <clears throat> by and large not farmed and that are wild space and preserved. And besides that, you want to remember in Queen Anne's County, one of the, I guess it's still in the county, Y Islander, right on the edge of it, is one of the most terrific wildlife spaces in the state of Maryland. So we are very flush. We've done a terrific job getting these parks together, getting the money up while it was still available from the state. And I think we're in good shape in that regard. Thank you, sir. I, I concur with Commissioner Wilson. Uh, Queen Anne's County has a lot of uh, dedicated open space. We have beautiful parks. We have just, if you come up to North County, you just have, minus the farmland, you got plenty of woods and streams and things that Chris probably ran around in when he was younger. And um, I think maintaining that, I think the county's already on that track. We have uh, roughly 2.1% of the entire county's land masses e can even be considered for development right now. So that's, that's pretty good when you look at us in, in terms of the whole state. Um, I think, like I said, I think we do a phenomenal job here, and I think that's one of the, re one of the things that makes the county um, a, a place that people like to come and live, um, regardless of whether they want to live on Kent Island or they want to live in North County, there's, there's diversity as to how you want to live, and, and, and I think that's one of the things that we need to maintain in this county, which I believe, going back to the comp plan, because that's the hot issue, um, the 2010 comp plan was highly regarded by everybody that was involved with it, and all the development you see on Kent Island was actually incorporated in that 2010 comp plan, so that stuff was here long before us. So. I'm going to interrupt for a brief program. You know, we both, Mr. Wilson, please pull the table back about four inches. I thought he was trying to push very me off very close to the edge. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've heard about the good candidates wanting to get close to the audience, but let's let's not fall off the stage to do a show. Um, Mr. Tillman, question to you: Can you comment on the value of preserved natural spaces, yes. not simply ag land versus development? Yeah, this is an issue that's very close to my heart. I was on the uh, board of directors for the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy for seven years and president for two, and that's all we did. And it wasn't just farmland, it was all land. Uh, organizations like that, uh, with uh, the county's efforts, which I applaud, and the cooperation of the county, which in general is pretty good, uh, is a good way to make sure that we preserve some of the land, not all of it. I'm, I'm not anti-growth. Uh, I don't want to see that happen. It wouldn't work. Uh, and it's interesting that you distinguished, or the uh, person that asked the question distinguished between farmland and, I guess, woodland. Uh, interestingly enough, from a farmer's point of view, we consider the woodlot a crop. Uh, the difficulty with that crop is you only get to harvest it once every 40 years and uh, we reseed it but that's permitted under the easements that we have on the property thank you thank you mr tillman mr moran question to you in short i agree with everything that's been said absolutely thank you sir mrs kruger question to you so obviously i agree with everything that's been said um if you look through the comp plan um the current comp plan um the wording actually is quintessential rural community and I would assume that if you ask people today if that's what they were looking for in our community, I would say that they would say the same thing. My family is outdoors all the time. We hike, we fish, we camp, um, we walk the trails all the time. And so obviously very important to me. Thank you, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. Harrison, question to you. The one thing no one's mentioned here is um, preserving wetlands. And wetlands are critical for the health of the bay. They're critical for flooding. They, they absorb so much of the water that's, that's coming down from rain, storms, whatever it may be. And part of, we, don't just, we, we shouldn't just preserve farmland. We need to be sure that we're uh, preserving critical wetlands as well. So I would agree. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. Mr. Dumino? Um, 
So to, to reiterate what Commissioner Steve Wilson uh, had said about um, the preservation of natural space here in, in Queen Anne's County, you know, that's something that, that our comprehensive plan um, has, that's always been a big part of the vision and, and what makes the Eastern Shore such an attractive place to come and visit. Um, and I don't know the exact uh, percentages, but, but, but comparatively speaking, I think Queen Anne's County has some of the most naturally preserved shoreline um, on the Chesapeake Bay. You talk about uh, Mattapeak, you talk about um, uh, the other parks and, and landings that we have um, here in Queen Anne's County. That's a lot of waterfront real estate that we have set aside um, as preserved natural space. So I think we're doing a great job on it. Um, when we ended the last part of the last session, a number of you, uh, on the, a number of candidates had addressed the county comprehensive plan as it currently exists. Uh, that plan is scheduled for a significant update and revision in 2020, um, which is within the term for which you are now competing. Um, what concepts, ideas, and visions will you bring to that revision process? Are any of them significant departures from the existing comprehensive plan? Mr. Corcorino, I believe we're finally around to that part of the program where you get to go first, sir. Thank you. Um, one thing that I want to make sure that we're doing is, uh, since the last comprehensive plan, there has been um, a lot of developments in, in technologies and way of pushing out information and then getting information back in from the public. So I want to make sure that we're doing that so that not just, you know, we call it stakeholder groups, but that each individual citizen has the opportunity to be contributing into the comprehensive plan because this is going to be the story of our county going forward. Um, another thing I think we need to focus on is with issues that people raise with, with global warming, more severe weather coming through, um, are there less vulnerable areas of the county that we can then direct development to so we're not having issues that we have now with flooding in areas where we, keep, we, we have development and flooding roads. If there are less vulnerable areas that we can use, incorporate some development to those areas, um, I would like to see that. Another thing that, that Jack had mentioned earlier uh, Jack Wilson mentioned earlier is the, the broadband initiative so that we can also develop economic development to areas of the county um, that have not seen the same level of prosperity as say Ken Island has. I think we need to be looking after the whole county and not just focusing our economic development in one area. Mr. Steve Wilson, question to you sir. Yeah folks, I, uh, <clears throat> I think one of the most interesting things about the comp plan is it arises really because it's so integral to how a county and the land around you and the, your whole environment develops. It arises from the people, not from us. And that I think that it's being involved in uh, in seeing that the balance of the people that are get involved in this and get to express their opinions is going to be the thing I think about the most, rather than my superimposing my ideas on top of uh, on top of the plan. It has to do with good representation. Thank you, sir. Mr. Yeah, Jacobs. I agree with Commissioner Wilson. That is one thing that I vow to is that I think we need to have a diverse uh, group of people, just as we did in 2010 when it was put together then, and a very transparent process. I will also uh, give a nod to uh, Mr. Corcorino's comment about uh, using technology to our advantage. I know it was a very painstaking process last time. A lot of it was done by hand. It was a lot uh, less um, using uh, historical data. So I think that'll be a benefit. And again, uh, from a, a specific concept to overlook, I, I think the island plan is pretty much where it is. There's not a lot of change there. Um, our, our census, we've gone up about 1,800 people in eight years, so I would say the comp plan did a pretty good job of controlling growth um, in a county this big. And at the end of the day, I would like to look at the North County, which was kind of brushed over um, in the last comp plan because of infrastructure um, uh, issues that, that we can't provide. And, looking at the 301 bypass to where the um, commerce is going to come from in North County. It's going to be on that corridor, so I think we need to look at, instead of growing outward, we should need to grow towards 301 in some of those towns up there. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tillman, question to you, sir. Uh, I agree that the comp plan really is a document that comes from the public or should arise from the public, and the important thing to do, the note I wrote down was listen. Uh, technology has to be in there. I think you have to use technology uh, to design it, but also acknowledge what technology can and can't do for you. I've been grumbling and fuming about broadband for years now, partly because I live someplace that's probably not going to get it for a while unless we do something really aggressive. Uh, 
I also am very interested in the implications of the bypass in Middletown and what it will do with the North County. And I think there's a great opportunity up there to uh, get some economic growth going, but it's only going to work if the people up there want it. And that's where listening becomes really important. And I think there you have to listen very carefully because it's a ticklish problem. Uh, there's not sewer and water up there and you know, do we really want another uh, Wawa? And if you put in a Wawa, you're going to get a Royal Farm. So we have to be real careful. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tillman. Mr. Moran, your question, sir. Who here uh, sitting up here has worked on the, the last comp plan? I worked in Ann Arundel. The last one here. So no one here has worked on a comp plan. Yes. It, 2000. Me. Thank you. Oh. But I'm in up here. People running for office. Oh. So okay. what that what that takes is, is professional planners. Number one, you got to have professional planners. Otherwise, you're going to get a hodgepodge of God knows what. You, we're going to have to take in climate change at this next comp plan. We're going to have to take in uh, traffic, which everyone wants to always bypass that, and the tier system. Queen Anne's County did not ad adopt a tier system, so whatever goes on with the comp plan has to be serviced by uh, septic systems. Or excuse me. Uh, sewage treatment plants, because otherwise it's just not going to happen. So, I mean, these are all things that need to be taken into account, and they're huge things. I mean, the, the bypass in Delaware, where the growth is going to go, has to be serviced by a sewage treatment plant, if there's any growth at all. So, it's, it's going to be a very interesting process, and you do need to listen to the public. I agree 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mrs. Kruger, your question. So, um, again, while doing my research, I did speak to um, several people that sat on the Blue Panel Commission for the 2010 comp plan, sat on people that sat on the citizens, um, spoke with people that sat on the Citizens Advisory Committee as well. And um, they explained to me how, how much detail obviously goes into it. But um, I'm a speech pathologist by trade. I listen to people. I believe everybody has a voice in their local government, state government, federal government obviously listen to the people with technology today there's other ways to reach people but face to face is always the best um, the plan that we have now it's you know it's very thorough well written well thought out plan it just needs updating for 10 years later like was mentioned traffic um, the 301 bypass coming in and possible um, economic development up that way and again all of the climate change needs to be taken and again I live on Ken Island worry about flooding, worry about um, coastline erosion. So we have to really address those issues. Thank you, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. Harrison, question to you. I think the comp plan uh, being reopened is starts with conversations with our neighbors. It, it has to include um, the, the sensitive areas. It has to recognize that Ken Island is our suburban population center and the North County is our, our rural agricultural base. Um, we, we need to find a way to bring broadband in. It is now an essential service. It's not a luxury anymore. It's a way that people can work from their home and not have to travel so much. Um, we, we need to seize on the opportunities that we will have and um, and engage with, with all the members of the community. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. Mr. Duminal, question to you. One minute, please. So I, I, I think we can all agree that there is going to be uh, a litany of changes uh, based on just the advances that we have made since the plan was first, uh, since the plan was updated 10 years ago. And I did have an opportunity uh, as a candidate running for office back then to sit on some of those blue ribbon panel hearings um, and there was a lot of uh, feedback from, from uh, all folks um, that were involved. Um, the comprehensive plan is a vision that has been consistent for 35, 40 years, and that is that we will be that quintessential rural community, but economically viable at the same time. And before we start heading north with infrastructure and growth, a lot of the folks that live up there live up there for a reason, because they, they don't want to live in, in the uh, the population density that we have in the south part of the county. So again, important to listen to the folks who live up north and really truly find out how much change they actually want up there. And, and also, real quick, one more thing, that the comprehensive plan has to, in my, in my opinion, needs to be easier and simpler to read. I don't know how many of you actually read your insurance policies, 
but that would put anybody to sleep. And, and I think our comprehensive plan is very, very thick and, and very difficult to read. And I think some versions need to be available, available to the public that are gonna be a lot easier to read and understand. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Mr. Coulter, your question. Well, I, I think there are a lot of, a lot of very smart answers have occurred, a lot of, a lot of good input from, from the folks up here. The comprehensive plan uh, is, is the citizen's opportunity every 10 years to have their input uh, to what the county is going to look like over the next 10 years. It becomes a roadmap. These, these fine people have talked about that. I got to say that uh, we have a, a really strong uh, planning department and they'll do they'll steward the process and they'll walk us through that process but it really every homeowners association every individual that wants to get involved the developers that want to get involved the pro environment that want to, wants to get involved they all need to come together and they all need to discuss what the vision is come to some consensus of that vision so that we can move forward as a good community that we all can be proud of Thank you, Mr. Coulter. I believe that concludes this round for this question. A follow-up question very quickly. Um, should the new comprehensive plan include contingency planning for managed retreat from coastal areas that are no longer viable? As seas rise, do we need to manage retreat from those regions? Mr. I'm Wilson, sorry, question I to you. Hear what manage what? Should, we, should the comprehensive plan, as we go forward, include provisions for managed retreat from inundated coastal spaces that are no longer viable. <laughs> that's, a, that's a beauty. Yes. <laughs> Glad you got that one. <laughs> I think, you know, as the tide comes up, everybody's going to be in full retreat. I, I don't know how you're going to, how the comprehensive plan is going to be coping with that. I don't, I'm unable to answer that question with any logical uh, meaning at all. Sure. I, I'm with you. I, I think that's a loaded question all the way around. I mean, you know, we, we're going to rely on science for a lot of what we look at from climate change and coastal rise and things like that. And, and, and look, we can all say it, we're going to rely on the science, but science isn't always perfect. When I grew up, there was a planet called Pluto. Then Pluto went away. Now Pluto is back. Eggs were bad for you. Now eggs are good for you. So, I mean, science is good. We can take it into account. But I don't know that we're going to plan for the next 10 years wrapped around how people are going to get out of there. We have an emergency management plan that if we get a hurricane, we have to evacuate people. We can get them out. But I mean, this is going to be a slow process. I don't. I don't know. I just, uh, this was. Go ahead, do the farm all the water. <laughs> Mr. Tillman, question to you. I, I'm not sure I understand the term managed retreat in the whether it's long term or short term. In the short term, that's emergency preparedness. Long term, I think it's probably good to uh, think of it philosophically uh, as to how you're going to get to certain houses that may not have a flooded basement, but you're going to have to get to them in a John boat. I mean, and I think that's probably closer than we think it is. And certainly the idea of sea level rise and the eastern shore sinking, which it is, uh, should be taken into account uh, in the master plan, obviously, in the comprehensive plan. But I don't have the same sense of immediacy or urgency that the question uh, implies. Mr. Tillman, thank you. Mr. Moran, your question. Well, it, it is a loaded question because there's it's so many variables that could, you could be referring to. But uh, the short answer I would say, in my opinion, is if somebody owns a piece of property and there's a road that gets to that piece of property now that's, that is plotted, that person can do as they feel. As far as moving forward with planning future, lots and or developments, we would take in the sea level rise. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Kruger, your question. Um, so I'm actually just going to read from um, this study that I uh, quoted before. And one of their suggestions is update to the comprehensive plan to incorporate sea level rise and related coastal hazards. This may include changes to ultimate land uses to account for sea level rise and coasting flooding, goals for sensitive, sensitive areas, water resources, and priority preservation areas should be updated accordingly. So I think that that's a good place to start. Thank you, ma'am. Mrs. Harrison, your question. I think to some of the recent storms that we've had, and um, uh, there's, there's times that we've had Route 8 flooded out. 
um, Southern Kent Island becomes an island on an island. Um, if, if you want to evacuate, you better go before they shut the bridges down. Otherwise, it's going to be a long haul up the Jersey coastline. Um, we have to be prepared for emergency responses. Um, we have to educate folks on the fact that you live on an island or um, in places that may be flooding. Um, we saw it during Hurricane Isabel. Most of our roads were cut off. Route 50 became the only access that we had. So I think it's something that we definitely need to consider moving forward with climate change going on. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. Mr. Dumino, your question. Um, I, I think what makes it a loaded question is the details that would have to be considered um, when preparing something. Um, but um, I, you know, obviously the comprehensive plan is a place where you can uh, update it um, to account for changes that have taken place and will continue to take place in our community. Um, and Mr. Frawley, I don't mean to make light of, of the question because uh, it is an important question. Um, but if there's any way that someone can look into a crystal ball and tell me when that happens, um, I'm gonna go into the business of building stilts for homes. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coulter, your response? Well, I think you gotta look at the, prop, the, the question in two parts. First of all, first of all, I, I don't think that you can have an evacuation plan as part of the comprehensive plan. They're two different kind of documents. An evacuation plan is a dynamic document. It has to do with the situations and, and those change over time. But I do think that we need to, in our comprehensive plan, contemplate the inevitable sea rise. And so when we're talking about zoning, we're talking about planning, we're talking about the use of land, we need to take that into consideration. And again, the comprehensive plan is a document that is put together by, by various groups, by, by the public, uh, with some stewardship from, uh, from the planning, uh, planning people. And that, that kind of data has to be input into the plan about what is the contemplation for for sea level rise and where will that occur and where where are the flood zones now? Those are those are those are planning issues, zoning issues that fairly fit into the comprehensive plan. The the issue of, of planning a hasty retreat in an emergency is an emergency document that's going to be a standalone document involving police and first responders and and other people. Which already exists. Yeah, and it's a dynamic kind of thing. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Mr. Corcorino, we'll finish with you. Sure. Um, so I think as others have mentioned, there's a difference between a, an emergent evacuation and then more of a, a longer term evacuation, evacuation due to erosion. And in, in, in my head, I, I'm uh, picturing, many of you may know this, that the house in the lower shore, and say the whole island was gone. It was just the house that was sitting there. The guy tries to bang to keep it there, right? Eventually, the water took it over, um, and, and it's now gone. Those types of um, erosions, although we, we see the erosion happen at a quicker clip than it was in the past, they still are not an overnight event. Um, and there are many things in place that are going to uh, affect the retreat. You're not going to be able to get flood insurance, so you're not going to be able to get a mortgage, you're not going to be able to build a house there. So I think there are already things in place that would address that. I want to thank all of our candidates here in a minute for their thoughtful engagement. I uh, do want to draw your attention to the cameras that are here. These are supplied by Midshore Community Television. They are a unit of the Avalon Foundation. The program is being recorded so that you can view it at home or encourage your friends and neighbors to view it at home. The web address is cbf.org slash mdforums cbf.org slash MD forums to check out the video online. Uh, great to have the Avalon folks here. I wanna thank the audience members, <coughs> Chesapeake College, Washington College, and Greg Farley for his excellent moderation skills, and of course, all of our candidates. Please give them a round of applause.